Welcome to the Sober Vibes Podcast. I'm your host, Courtney Anderson. I decided to end my decade-long love affair with alcohol in 2012 at 29 years old. I chose to live openly as a recovering alcoholic with honesty and humor while figuring it out one day at a time. This space will bring you weekly episodes of my own personal experiences with my addiction and sobriety, as well as me interviewing incredible souls who are living life without drugs and alcohol. This podcast is here to inspire you, empower you, uplift you, and bring you some laughter along the way in your own journey. Sit back, relax, and let's have a time. This is Courtney Anderson. Welcome to the Sober Vibes Podcast. I am your host and sober pal. You are listening to episode 77. Today, I have an awesome guest. We had such a great talk, very similar uh, stories, and I just felt like we vibed well and I learned a lot from her. So today, I hope you learn a lot from her as well. Before I get started to introduce you to my guest today, remember if you need any type of help in looking for a coach, I do have one-on-one services or my Sober Focus coaching program. The links are either on my website, CourtneyRecovered.com, or you can find the link directly in the show notes below. Make sure too you take advantage of that awesome discount that Curious Elixirs is providing, $10 off a purchase of $50 or more. So I have to say thank you for sponsoring the podcast for the month of February. Amazing, because Curious Elixirs is great, and I really do... I have a newfound love for number one and number four. And disclaimer, as always, if mocktails and NA beers are not your jam, don't drink them. If they're triggering to you, just don't do it. But if they're not, have fun with it. You can have fun with soda water with a splash of cranberry juice or a cup of coffee, okay? But that is my disclaimer. So if they trigger you, please don't go down that rabbit hole. So today's guest Veronica Valley. She is a recovery coach and therapist. She is an author and she is a podcast host of the podcast called Soberful. She also just wrote her book, Soberful, and it just came out, I believe, a month ago. Check it out. I really hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. Again, I will have all the links to her in the show notes below. As always, reach out to me on Instagram, make sure you rate review and subscribe to the show. So you never miss an episode. And if there's any type of topic you want me to talk about, slide into my DMS at sober vibes on Insta. All right. Enjoy. Hi, Veronica. Welcome to the sober vibes podcast. Hi, Courtney. It's very nice to be here. And I love the uh, the, the name Sober Vibes. It's cool. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I came up with that a couple of years ago. I, you know, you played around, it played around mm. with the word sober and it's a vibe, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Veronica, when did you get sober? I got sober May 2nd, 2000. Nice. So coming up to 22 years ago. <laughs> Do you, and I had, this is because I like to ask people who have mm-hmm. long-term sobriety like this, do you still get excited every sober anniversary? Oh, hundred percent. hundred percent. I, in fact, it's, it's my belly button birthday next week. I'm going to be 49 and I could not be less interested. Like I right. could not, I actually changed, like I've, it took me years to figure this out, but I kind of hate when it's your birthday and everyone posts these messages on Facebook. I changed it. So my it doesn't come up because I'm like, I honestly, I couldn't care less about it. But I have my kids are really excited because, you know, kids having a birthday is like the most exciting thing ever. Right. But no, I feel but having a sober birthday, oh, I go all out. I want to celebrate. I want flowers. I want it. I want to tell everyone like it's uh, yeah, it doesn't it's never got old for me. Now, do you treat yourself or do you like do you just put on a big celebration? What do you usually do? For years, it would always be, you know, I I go to AA, so I'd always do something with my AA crowd Mm -hmm. of some kind. My husband's really good. He always buys me flowers. We Mm -hmm. we treat it as a special day. Yeah. As you should, right? Yeah, absolutely. You really should. It it really, I I actually did a podcast episode on this about a while ago. It it is, it's not, the, the amount of time you have doesn't 
correlate necessarily to the quality of your sobriety. Yeah, yeah. And, and some people don't count days, but the reason I do is there's a very clear line in the sand for me of mm -hmm. my life before and after that date. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you know, everything I have is because of that date. And that's, you know, that's just absolutely concrete for me. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with you a hundred percent on that. Cause I'm a day counter too. You know, I'll look at my clock yeah. and, and what, and especially to last year, I didn't really have to look, but ever since becoming a new mom, I'm like, okay, what day am I on? <laughs> Cause you know, becoming a new mom and these first couple months, it's hard. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Oh my God. That's time slows down when you're a new mom, right? It really does. These, <laughs> these days are very, very long, Veronica. How old is your baby? Uh, he is four and a half. He'll be five months on February yeah. 1st. So oh, yeah, and it's so crazy because everyone's probably saying to you, like, it goes so fast. And it is I have a 10 year old and a six year old. And I'm like, it, it, when you're in it, it feels like it lasts forever because you're so exhausted. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, they're 10 and you're like, geez. Yeah. Where did it go? I know. Yeah. <laughs> Enjoy every minute. Yeah. I, I mean, I still can't believe he's about to be five months, but it is uh. definitely going back though to sobriety and, and for me and, you know, yes, everybody's different with counting days and whatnot, but it's just, it is something, as you said there, it's, we get two lives in one, you know, the, the life before in our active addiction and then in our sobriety and recovery, it's totally different. Yeah. So what yeah. brought you to the point where you said no more with, with alcohol? So I would class myself as an alcoholic. I, I identify very strongly with that word. I mean, mm -hmm. I cannot drink. There was mm -hmm. no, I, it's really interesting. Even before I f drank alcohol, I felt I, very uncomfortable in my own skin. And then when I s found alcohol at about 15, it, it was the solution. And it was the solution for 12 years, but there was an enormous price to pay. So I, I went into drug induced psychosis when I was 18. So I spent, I was actively looking for help mm -hmm. for about nine years before I got sober, but I thought my problem, and it's really important to understand what the problem is and what the problem isn't. I thought my problem was a rare mental health condition. And it was the, the anxiety and the panic attacks that came from the psychosis. I didn't really, ever think my drinking was a problem because I drank like my peer group. Mm -hmm. Like I just drank like everyone around me. And I, I graduated from university, had a job. I, I didn't, you know, think that that was the problem. And it, I, I eventually I met someone. So I was looking for help, always looking for help. Se therapists, psychiatrists, psychologists, always looking for help to fix me. Like, you know, I wanted someone to fix me because I wasn't okay. And then I met someone who was sober and it kind of rang some bells. Mm -hmm. And I, I went to AA because that's all there was 22 years ago. There mm -hmm. wasn't, the, the internet wasn't a thing. Right. And I didn't identify, didn't relate. Just none of the things had happened to me. I was much younger than most of the people there. I was only 27. And it wasn't until somebody spoke about fear and they spoke about fear in a way that I've never heard anyone speak about it. And I thought I was the only one who felt that way. I really thought everyone else was was fine. I thought you were fine. Everybody looked fine to me. Mm -hmm. And this person spoke about fear and how fear was the root of their drinking. And I was spellbound because I, that was me. And that's when everything fell into place for me. It's like, I drink because of how I feel. And, mm -hmm. and it just, it was, yeah, it was a real kind of moment of clarity. And, and, and for that, from that moment on, I was just committed to being sober, doing the 12 steps. And then, you know, therapy and all just just doing this deeper work so I could have the life that I wanted to have. Mm -hmm. And what was the fear that you had? You know, and that's the thing. It was it was just it wasn't a specific fear. It was fear of everything and anything and nothing. But it really come down to two things. It was limiting beliefs. Mm -hmm. It was the fear of not being good enough mm -hmm. and the fear that I wasn't lovable because I wasn't good enough. Mm -hmm. And those two belief systems ruled my life and my whole experience. And they just dominated everything. And you can't, like, how do you put that into words? Like, I couldn't tangibly say that to anyone. It yeah, just sounds it's a hard, so silly. Right. It's a hard one to express. It, it, it really is, but it, it eats away at you. And, and mm -hmm. the, the outcomes of my life were from that belief system. So yeah, that, I, and I realized that 
all of my decisions and actions were based, came from fear. And, and, mm -hmm. and what I did and what I chose to do was all about, if I do this, will I be safe? Will I be safe if I, you know, will I be okay if I, you know, so it, it really, it, it's incredibly powerful, all this stuff that is underneath at the root of an alcohol problem. Oh, for sure. Because don't you agree that you think that anybody can stop drinking? You can stop drinking, but it's, it's the recovery healing process. That's really more of the eye opener of you find out why exactly you drank the way that you did. <laughs> and then you're like, Oh, I have to go through these emotions now. I have to figure yeah. this all out without numbing out any of these feelings that I was suppressing for so long. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really, it, it's really crazy. And, you know, and that's the big thing that people discover is, you know, I, I thought, you know, if I stopped drinking everything, I'd be all right, you know, everything mm -hmm. would be fine. And, and then that's when you realize that alcohol is just a symptom. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's all of the other stuff that's underneath that. Cause we def I defaulted to alcohol as a way to, I didn't know how to live in this world. I didn't know how to navigate this world and, and deal with people. I just defaulted to alcohol. Mm -hmm. You know, if I felt uncomfortable, if I felt worried about something, if I felt, you know, social situations, alcohol. Right. So when you don't have it, you don't have these tools that, that we need. Right. And now those limiting beliefs that you had, were they something of your upbringing kind of instilled into you? Or was it just something that just you started believing along the way? So that's exactly how limiting beliefs are formed. They, they are formed from our earlier experiences. Mm -hmm. It's how we interpret events. Mm -hmm. So yes, I had a, a chaotic childhood. I was raised by a, a single parent mother who had mental health problems. So my emotional needs were never met. Mm. And, and I had a lot of feeling of, uns of not being safe. Mm -hmm. So, and there was a lot of messaging in my family. I was just talking about this with a client. You know, one of the things that was said to me is like, don't make a fuss, don't make a fuss. If you got upset, don't make a fuss. And the message there is your feelings are insignificant. Mm -hmm. How you feel is insignificant. Don't just, you know, how other people, other people's comfort and well-being is way more important. So I interpreted that to mean how I felt didn't matter. And I, so then I'd have all these big feelings and, and the, the adults around me were not in remotely equipped to deal with any big feelings. So I had to push them down. So I felt like I was going to explode. Like I didn't, I, I, you know, I wasn't, how I'm raising my kids and I'm sort of sure how you're going to raise your son. I want to raise them with emotional intelligence. You know, it's mm -hmm. really funny. Just the other day, I was having a heated discussion with my elder son about something. And he said to me, mommy, you hurt my feelings when you said that. And I was just like, so happy because, <laughs> because he can say that to me. Right. He can, he can identify his feelings and he can say to me that I hurt them. And I can hear him and, and say, you, you're right. I, I, how I, I regret how I said that. That was wrong of me. Mm -hmm. And that, that, like, I never had that when I was growing up. No. You know, to have my child be able to ha be develop emotional intelligence in that way, that's really, I think, the core of it. Yeah, it's really hard because I grew up with the same situation and functioning alcoholic father and, you know, mother with mental health issues. And it's that emotional needs not being met does a lot of damage. It really does. Mm -hmm. It really, really does. You know, we can have everything on the outside, you know, the house is perfect. Mm -hmm. We go to all the right schools and all of that is worth nothing. Right. It's the, it's the, it's the emotional stuff that really, really matters how we feel. And, you know, we have these vibrant inner lives and I just had to lock mine away mm -hmm. um, and and sobriety is it sobriety is really this reconnection with ourselves mm -hmm. it's this reconnection with this vibrant inner life and what's really going that really you know that's the gift yes and it is a gift mm. and you know without it too there's just uh, for me personally i my I, my life wouldn't be where it is today if i didn't choose back in august 18th of 2012 to quit drinking you know and I know you feel the same way too. Exactly, right? Exactly, all of that. Curious elixirs are booze-free craft cocktails infused with adaptogens to help you unwind. 
Whether you're sober or sober curious, toasting your friend or sipping solo, Curious Elixirs is on a mission to create the world's most sophisticated cocktails without the alcohol. Inspired like classics like the Aperol Spritz and Spicy Margarita. Every Curious Elixir is handcrafted with organic ingredients and no refined sugar. Their ingredients include adaptogens and plants that benefit your body, helping you relax and distress without the hangover. They offer one-time orders as well as subscribers-only Curious Cocktail Club to ensure your fridge stays stocked. Order Curious Elixirs online and have it shipped directly to your door at CuriousElixirs.com or you can find the direct link in the show notes below. Remember to use code SOBERVIBES22 at checkout where you will receive $10 off, $50 or more. My personal favorite is number four. You can either order the flavor separately or order a mix pack. I suggest ordering the box with the mixed flavors so you can try them all and have fun with them. I got my husband into them over the holidays and he loved them. Again, you can sip them at dinner. You can bring them over to a friend's house, go into a party. You know, there's there's going to be alcohol there and you don't want to drink. Bring a couple with you. I guarantee you no one will ever know because they really do look like cocktails. The coloring is perfect, perfect, perfect. So just pour over some ice, put some fruit in each one of them, and you are good to go. Remember to use code SOBERVIBES22 at checkout to receive your $10 off your orders of $50 or more. And again, the link is in the show notes below. Enjoy. So kind of getting into our chat today, I mean, we, we spoke a lot, you, see, you brought a lot of goodness for right now, but I kind of wanted to go into a topic with you, a couple different topics, because I think you'll be great explaining this all, but you know, one of why does stopping drinking feel so hard? Because that's a great one because it it is, it's one of those things you think about it and you're like, Oh my God, I have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, yeah. H, I, J, yeah. K. <laughs> Just yeah. where you keep going and you're like, no, I can't stop until next year. Yeah, it's really interesting because it's different to everything else. You know, if, if I said to you, Courtney, you can't eat strawberries because that's why you feel depressed and low and that's why you feel really crappy the next morning. You know, that's why you have no energy. You'd be like, mm. <laughs> I will never eat a strawberry again. Yeah. But the, the reason that we feel like this about alcohol is we have been culturally conditioned to believe that alcohol is the best way to have fun, excitement, belonging, connection, relax, and to reward ourselves. And if you think about how we were raised, and we were both raised in different countries, it was never presented to me ever that not drinking alcohol was an option. Yeah. Right. So yeah. you're, we were raised to believe that we were going to get a job, we're going to get a driver's license, and we're going to have alcohol to have fun and relax mm -hmm. and, and feel part of the gang. Mm -hmm. Like I never questioned that. I, and I couldn't wait to get started. For me, alcohol was the entrance into the land of grown ups in this fun, exciting, sophisticated world. Mm -hmm. So when we begin this battle of really not liking the consequences of alcohol, beginning to regret, you know, how alcohol makes us feel. We intellectually understand that it's bad for us and we don't want to feel that way. But emotionally, we feel like we have to give up all of those things and the price feels too high. I mean, who wants to live a life devoid of fun mm -hmm. or belonging? I mean, right. that sounds like horrible, <laughs> awful. <laughs> right. So the reason that, that quitting drinking feels so hard is because we have to believe, we believe we have to give up things that we cannot get anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So it feels quite devastating. It feels like a devastating loss. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a breakup for sure. And you got to grieve yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, when I stopped drinking at 27, I completely 100% believed that. I was not happy about that. I really thought my life was going to be very gray and dull but it was so insane inside of my head I, I wanted peace like I just wanted some peace some tranquility and safety that's what I wanted those feelings so I reluctantly was prepared to pay the price of never having fun again and then I discover within about a year that none of those things are true 
Mm-hmm. That, and, and that's been, you know, I say this all the time. If I wasn't having fun, if this wasn't an incredible experience, I would have been drunk 21 years ago, believe mm-hmm. me. I mm-hmm. mean, and, and, but that's, that's the bit, there's a period of time when you're in no man's land where you've stopped drinking, but it just feels hard and not very exciting and a bit gray. And people are telling you it gets better, but it doesn't feel like that. Right. But you, you, that's why we need a community and a guide and, and all of that stuff to get to this place where it, it, we begin to have these experiences where it feels better. And, and I hear this, and I'm sure you have the same thing from sober people all the time. That's why we never lose the gratitude is just, you know, like on Sunday morning, we are the first where we, we live in the mountains so we can go skiing. We're like first on the slope, Sunday morning, we're up at six, it feels great to be up at six, get things done, get on skiing where it's quiet, you know, before all the crowds get there. And I'm skiing down the mountain going, this is priceless. Yeah, it's this true. Is, this is, I, I could, you know, and I still, at that last Sunday, I thought, imagine just being in bed all day with a hangover on Sunday mm-hmm. or doing this. I mean, there's no comparison. There's really not a comparison because when you come from that place and when you've wasted so many days, laying in your bed or on your couch, me Mm. like dry heaving on yourself and then eating terrible food at six just to feel better. And then the following day, you're still kind of hung over. And then it takes you like by the fourth day to finally get rid of that hangover. So when you do go out and like, and do some living, it is really, it pulls at your heartstrings. I completely agree with you on that 100%. I mean, even if I just, if my husband and I, I mean, not currently right now with, with our five month old, but previous to him, like just going out to breakfast on a Sunday, it's like, oh, I feel great sitting here. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's little things, Mm -hmm. little things that, you know, I mean, for me, the big thing is I love getting up early at the weekends and doing stuff. I mean, we're the family that does, you know, we're on our bikes, we're here. And, and I just love that because I have the energy, I've had enough sleep, but it, it's, it, it's also the other thing is, is moments of connection with people. Yeah. Like sometimes it's random, sometimes just moments of connection that are meaningful and real. That, that's a, that's a buzz, you know, that you can't, that's better than anything I ever experienced with alcohol. You know, there's kind of fake connections where you're in the bar or whatever, and you're just like, whatever you you feel so connected and in the moment but then i would see those people two days late in the grocery store and avoid them oh yeah because i felt embarrassed or ashamed or it, it like there was an ickiness it didn't you know mm-hmm. and at the time i thought it was the best thing ever and we were best buddies but it wasn't real no i used to have really riveting conversations with people high on cocaine and then the next day oh. it would be like crickets <laughs> Yeah. Oh my God. Oh, you're an ex Coke user. Me too. Uh, yeah. Uh, three for three years. I really, I really loved cocaine. <laughs> my drug of choice has always been alcohol, but for three years there, I, I really dove deep with cocaine. So me, me too. I'm really, I'm really grateful to cocaine because it, it brought me to my knees. It yeah. just brought me to my knees. I actually think I would have carried on drinking for at least another 10 years if not more, mm-hmm. if I hadn't have used cocaine. So I feel gratitude that I did that because it just finished me off in about 18 months. Yeah. I mean, cocaine, it's, Ugh. it's crazy. It's crazy. It's a horrible drug. So is that what you're though saying, going back to the alcohol lie is what mm-hmm. you kind of stated in the beginning of we we were born to believe you know, alcohol is fun. And, and mm. this is where we get our social aspect from and you celebrate, you drink, you had a bad day, you drink. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and really, the alcohol lie is the big lie is that the consequences are kept from us, mm-hmm. and you know the way in our culture, the way we minimise and humorise hangovers, and and I used to have some pretty spectacular hangovers, but again, culturally, we are told like, oh, our hangover is funny, and it just means that you had an it, it's evidence of an amazing night. But you know, those consequences were really substantial for me. You know, I, just like you said, I couldn't function for days. I, you know, missed opportunities. I failed at things. I was like inadequate in a lot of things because I just physically felt so crap. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what one of the things that kind of drives me crazy. And, and I say this to my clients, we do a cost benefit analysis of their drinking and we really look at the cost and we look at money, we look at time 
And then we look at the impact on relationships. We look at also the big things like the impact on my dignity, on my integrity, on my goals. And when you look at it like that, it adds up. And I'm like, are you getting a good return on your investment? Yeah. Is the fun that you're having it, it, worth the, what you're investing here? And then that's when the whole thing begins to crumble because it's like, well, you know, being hungover, missing my kid's soccer game, feeling like an idiot. Like actually the, the night out really wasn't a big deal when I look at that price. So the, the alcohol lie is that you get to the land of fun, excitement, belonging, connection, all those things without any cost. But the cost is massive. And it, we, we do a really good game of smoke and mirrors in our culture so that we don't have to see it. Mm -hmm. I wonder, though, do you think that's only the smoke and mirrors only have to go with the, with alcohol? Because I feel it's do you ever feel like this? It's like, you know, alcohol is the only drug that you have to explain not using. And I think about yes. this from time to time. I just watch Dope Sick on Hulu, you uh, know, talk, talking yeah. about the opiate epidemic. And, you know, it's like shame on these alcohol companies as well. <laughs> it's just one of those things. It's like alcohol is not looked at as the same as opiates you know, as, as other drugs where it's like, if I were to go and start smoking crack in front of people, they would have something to say, but going and drinking in front of people, it's like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Come and join us. Yeah, it's, it is. It's very normalized. We've normalized abnormal drinking in our culture. Yes. And, and it is the only drug that you have to explain not using and it's because of everything that we've just said it's because of this belief system you know people when you when you have a group of friends and somebody stops drinking it really upsets the apple cart mm -hmm. because if you're saying i'm not going to drink anymore it doesn't agree with me i don't like how it makes me feel people take that interpret it very personally mm -hmm. so it's like well if you're saying you're drinking too much and it's not good for you what does that mean about my drinking yeah. and uh, people are very invested in you know, uh, uh, there's a lot of, you know, pushback with when people quit. And, and the reason for that is when you say that you don't want to drink anymore, people are not hearing like you're quitting alcohol because it's bad for you. What they're hearing you say is I'm volunteering to never have fun again for the rest of my life. Yeah. Cause it, and it, that's what people don't understand. Yeah. Because if I was like, hey, I'm going to stop smoking crack, everybody would be like, good for you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's, with alcohol, it's like, Oh, are you going to judge us now for having drinks? Yeah. So it's just one of those things. It's like, and I know it's because alcohol is so ingrained into our society and you're just learning a lot from how it came out or just how it has um, risen, I guess, in, you know, hundreds of hundreds of years and people have always been allergic to it. <laughs> There's yeah. always been, you know, alcohol has never been good for majority of people. Yeah. It, it, and it's such a high cost in our culture. You know, it, it's, you. I mean, going back to drugs, I watch Dope Sick as well. And mm -hmm. the thing about that is there's now going to be a generation of traumatized children mm -hmm. that will, ha which will give, who will give birth to tra more traumatized children because the legacy of that explosion of opioids is, going to be catastrophic but it's been like that f with alcohol for centuries centuries you know? mm -hmm. it, it's it, still the deaths from alcohol still outweigh the deaths from drugs yeah but and it's really also very interesting is people don't want to hear about this people mm. i find this kind of um, my book came out today and it's really interesting talking to my publicist you know talking to different shows and media outlets and people are quite happy to, but can we talk about dry January and tips for cutting down? Because in the public's mind, it's like you're either rock bottom Charlie Sheen, which is awful, yeah. or you're just going to do dry January. Uh, which because I everybody else in the middle is just fine. And we don't want you kind of holding up a mirror that maybe there's a bit more to that than we realize. Oh, and what has pissed me off now, because I don't ever, if people want to do dry January, I, I support them, but you don't ever hear me say dry January or, or get behind it or promote it on my social media or sober October because too many people do it. And then they end up right back where they started and it's like a reward. And I just, it's it, for people who have problems with alcohol, it, 
it's it's just a continuous reward system. And but I want to say on this, now they have a thing going around called damp January. And it's Ugh. like, you know, where it's just like a play and it's like, this is now making a joke into now keep justifying that, you know, it's okay if you did not make it the 30 days, just rephrase it to damp January. Yeah, I have mixed feelings about it as well, because I have clients who got sober from dry January. Yes, But I also think it gives a message that, I did dry January, so you can stop anytime. I've kind of reset my body and done something really healthy. And I, and then they just pick up and drink like they did before. And actually it doesn't make any difference whatsoever if you no. the next 11 months you're you're drinking to higher levels. So I, yeah, it, and it's, it is kind of like, I, I feel that it does give the message that just do dry January, sober October, you're good. And, exactly. and it's just, it's just not, but here's the thing, only, people who have an issue with alcohol will do those things. Mm -hmm. People who don't have an, a problem with alcohol, they don't do dry January because they don't think about drinking or not drinking. They just have right. an occasional drink, enjoy it, don't think any more of it. It's only people who are having a struggle that will do those things. Right. Exactly. That's a, and then plus two, like going back what you said with like the, the, the trauma, you know, when, when I quit drinking nine years ago, my, my then boyfriend, he's my husband now, but him and I sat within, you know, those first couple months and talked about how we wanted to break the cycle for future generations mm. in that we have, because that is something that, you know, it, it just gets swept under the mat because, you know, drinking so socially acceptable, but mm. that's also too why I can't get behind the dry Januarys and the sober October. It's like, just because you got sober for 30 days and you went back to drinking, there's still kids there hurting from mm. your actions. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's the other thing about the cost that, pe that if you're a parent there, there is, it affects your children. Oh, I've yeah. had many clients say to me, you know, I always did it after they went to bed and you know, they never knew they knew. They know. They, right. they know. They know you're not. You're irritable in the morning. Mm -hmm. they, they know that you're not available to them after a certain time in the evening, and it does have an impact. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, they smell it on you the next day. Yeah, because kids are smart. Kids aren't mm -hmm. stupid. Kids are smart, mm -hmm. and they pick up on that. And if it's something that they've known from birth, that is what they know, and they can pick up on the cues. So yeah, and I also want to say for anyone listening who is a parent and they did drink. What is enormously powerful is whatever age your kids are, is them seeing a mm -hmm. parent get help for a problem and change. Mm -hmm. And there's an incredible amount of healing and recovery that can happen for the whole family when someone with an alcohol problem decides to, you know, get help. And, and that's an incredible example to your children. So I don't want parents to listen to this and be beating themselves up yeah, because no. we're all struggling and trying to get through the day, you know, mm -hmm. and we didn't know what we didn't know. And, and no, from day one of your sobriety, you are also doing something incredible for your children because at some point your kids will be adults and they will struggle with something. And to have that example that mom, dad struggled with this and they got help and they changed, then they can too. So there's a lot of good that can be taken from, from that experience. Yeah. And even having adult children, you know, you, it's never too late to change and take no. that responsibility no. because even your adult children will be like, oh my God, I get to have a mom or a dad present right now, you know, and it's just, it's a different relationship, but yes, mm -hmm. I totally agree with you that it's, it's 100% needed and appreciated. Yeah. So, well, why don't you tell us about your book? Cause it came out today. Yeah. So it's called Soberful, Uncover a Sustainable, Fulfilling Life Free of Alcohol. And it's a program. I, I really felt there was a gap in a lot of the quitlet. There's some wonderful quitlet out there. There's some <laughs> great, great stories, but I felt that people were lacking the how, the, the what, what is it I need to do exactly to not just get sober, but to be happy, to feel safe, to feel emotionally balanced. So it's, it explains the five pillars of sobriety 
and how if which is just personal development if we work those how not only will we be sober but we will also feel more balanced within ourselves we'll be able to achieve our goals all of that kind of stuff i love it and then the podcast too yeah and i have this sober before podcast with my old boss chip summers we've been doing it for about four years now so we have a lot of fun there chip's been sober 36 years he's been a psychotherapist for a long time and I, yeah so we have a bit of sobriety between us and some experience Love it. um <laughs> and then where can people find you so you can find me on instagram veronica j valley uh, soberfull.com i have a facebook group called soberfull as well so if you just put my name or soberfull into google it should come up okay and i will also have all of the links in the show notes so make sure that you check out veronica's book and her podcast too and yes this was a great conversation thank you so much courtney i'm so glad we connected yes me too all right thank you and thank you everybody for listening make sure if you haven't already to rate review and subscribe to the show stay healthy and keep on trucking everyone bye